Good evening. This lecture is Bezrat Hashem Leilui Mishmat Michael Jeffrey Melner and the Mitziat Zivug Leosnat Batsonia. Also Leilui Mishmat Felip Yuda Silva. And the recovery of the family from his passing away. So, as you know, as we speak, the President of the United States is on the way to Israel. I just hope that it's not going to be an embarrassment and he will think he's in Jordan <laughs> when he's there, you know. They think the whole world is stupid. They take a person that doesn't remember where he is, doesn't remember his name, doesn't remember the way to his office and wants him to run the world. Don't get me wrong, until now, all presidents were puppets, besides Trump. All the previous ones, they have advisors and people that run the show. They just put someone with a nice face in the front, and they make all the decisions. Mr. President, Mr. President, it's all baloney, it's all nonsense. Finally came Trump. You know, it's a little bit difficult to tell him what to do. He thinks he knows everything. So he didn't survive. Yeah, oh, you don't gonna, you're not going to cooperate with us. You don't let us rule you. We'll destroy you. And you see what's happening now. This one is a very good one because he doesn't even remember what he was told. He doesn't remember. He's eight years old. His condition, his, his brain condition is not good. It's very good for them. They even write to him what to say, so they come. Yeah. It's so sad that the world has come to such a situation. I just wonder who really make all the decisions. <laughs> who really is the one, I mean, the, the people behind the scene. Who really runs this country? Hashem runs the world, we know it. But who is the messenger behind all this? So we will see, we will see what's coming out of this uh, visit. We will find out, Bezrat Hashem. So anyway, I'm going to speak a little bit about things that I couldn't finish yesterday. As you know, there are two things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not like to do. Does not like to do. A, to interfere with the free choice of the human being, the free will. And, to, and B, to interfere with the laws of nature and perform a clear miracle for a human being. Many times in life there are things we don't like to do. Yeah, that was the continuation of my words. We also, we also... <laughs> We also don't like to do certain things in life, and we try to avoid it as much as we can. But sometimes we run to a dead end. We have no choice. We have to do it, right? So sometimes we make, we bring a Kadosh Baruch Hu to a point that we actually kind of force him to do something he didn't really want to do. I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about from an example I gave to Hasid Satmir. Satmir Hasid. For those of you who don't understand what it means, Satmir, I give you a little explanation. On the border between Hungary and Romania, there's a place called Satmir. Many Hasidish Jews came from there. They belong to this. Supposedly, it's the biggest Hasidut. From all the Hasiduyot, it's the biggest number. And. Uh, they had a very holy, big tzaddik, Talmid Chacham Rabbi, in the beginning. His name was Rav Yoel Misatmer. A very zealous to Hashem. Just like Eliyahu Navi, Elijah the prophet in those days. He was the type that was burning for the Kedusha of Hashem. Modesty, Ashkafa. Extremely holy. And... After, obviously, he went to heaven, you can't replace someone like that, you know, since then, I mean, you can't replace someone like that. Some people have really no replacement, even though they say everyone has a replacement, it's baloney. 
Some people do not have replacement. King Solomon has replacement? No. No one ever could, could ever replace him for the last 3,000 years. King David had a replacement. Moshe Rabbeinu had a replacement. Rabbi Akiva had a replacement. Of course not. Can you find today someone to replace Rashi? Or Rambam? Or Ramchal? Or the Ari Kadosh? Ari Kadosh is a perfect example. 2,000 years, no one was like that. It's much like a prophet. He only lived 500 years ago. Some people have no replacement. So, to give you a little bit background, the Satmer movement, they were in the beginning when they saw the wicked Jewish, communist, Zionist, anti-God, anti-Torah people in Europe are politically, making political effort to bring the Jews after the Holocaust into Israel and form a state in Israel. Because the people that were involved before the Holocaust, it was Herzl. There were other activists before the Holocaust. Once the Holocaust happened, those communist, wicked, Rishaim, they took advantage on the situation. The world had a little sympathy to the Jews after they murdered millions of them, millions. And they, they realized that's the time for us to start and go to Israel and form a state there. 1917, it was the second uh, immigration wave to Israel. First one was all religious people, 19, 1880. If anyone asks you who really started Israel, the answer is the Haredim. The ultra-Orthodox Jews, they came in, 80, in 1880 when Israel was all swamps. Swamps and deserts. There was nothing there. You couldn't plant any tree. There was few Arabs there. and There was really nothing. Of course, there was no Palestinian state. There was no nation there. There was few Arabs here and there living in the desert. They couldn't do anything in the land because it was all swamps. They didn't have the, the brain to figure out how to dry all the swamps and the malaria. And there was a lot of mosquitoes and people would get beaten and die. Three days later, many people were dying. They had high fever and they died. Then the Jews came from Europe, Yoel Moshe Salomon, Zerach Baranet, all these people, uh, Stemperer. There's a lot of uh, famous names. We learn about them in school. Of course, no one ever told us that they were Hasidim and uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, Jews from Europe. So uh, among those uh, Ashkenazim that came from Europe in 1880, also 5,000 Yemeni Jews came at the same time. So it was a combination of Temanim and Ashkenazim. They came to Israel and they started to dry the, the, the swamps by planting uh, eucalyptus trees. The eucalyptus tree drink a lot, suck everything. Slowly, slowly, all the swamps disappeared. There was no malaria, nobody died anymore. And they formed more than 30 cities. Some of them are huge cities in Israel today, like Petah Tikva, Rishon Lezion, massive cities. They have close to a million residents there in each city. And they really put the foundation for, for a Jewish state. Later, like 30, 37 years later, all the wicked Jews, the anti-God, the people that cannot stand religion, the most corrupted people in the history, they all came in one shot from Russia and Poland. All the, what, what they call Tzioinim, Zionist. When you hear the Iranians are cursing the Tzioinim and the Arabs and, the, and Hamas, these are the Tzionim they are talking about. Even though today they don't make a difference between them and the religious people. But the beginning, the whole idea of the Arabs hating the Tzionim is those kind of wicked people, which we all have to hate them. It's not allowed to love them. This is enemies of Hashem. They want to destroy the Torah. They want to wipe out Judaism. They want to destroy the mitzvot. 
they want, of course, they were not bad as the people today, as the secular people in Israel today. Not, for instance, those wicked Zionim, they would never dare to marry men with men. They had some, some values, as wicked as they were, for instance, they would not allow the man and a woman to live together if they're not married. They were very much against assimilation. They didn't want Jews to marry the Goim. They wrote a letter to the son of Herzl, Hans. Look what the name he gave his son, Hans, a Nazi name. You ashamed us by marrying a non-Jewish woman. You bring a shame to all the, the Zionist movement. Then he wrote to them, shame on you, all of you hypocrite people. Where were, we, where were you when my father was lighting Christmas tree in a house and sent us to the church to, to learn? None of you made a beep. Now when I marry a non-Jewish woman, you have complaints? Don't you know that my father refused to circumcise me? And he lived 100% like a Christian? So what all of a sudden you're preaching to me that I marry a non-Jew? His end was that he committed suicide. That was his end. This is all before the Holocaust. After the Holocaust, all these Reshaim, they found an opportunity to start coming to Israel. And they all started to come. And they occupied everything, meaning they put the religious people to sleep, be quiet, like dogs. We run the show because we are now the majority. And they started to form an army. What does it mean? They had uh, one organization called the Haganah, other one called the Etzel, the other one called Lehi, which they were all against each other. Instead of being together, if you finally come to fight, politics got involved. They even killed each other. That's how much against each other they were. But they were all fighting for the same cause. But there was a lot of politics. Ego, who will steal the show, who would lead, you know, who will have more power. Same thing like the politicians of today. One day they hug, the next day they stab each other in the back. So, when this all happened, Rav Yoel Misatmer was standing and screaming that no one should cooperate with this Reshaim. Why? Since when you're allowed to even talk to them? You're not allowed to step in the same room with them. Not to talk about helping them to form the state of Israel. If Hashem wants the Jews to return to Israel, let him bring the Messiah and bring all the Jews into Israel on a magic rug. He doesn't need war, and he doesn't need an army, and he doesn't need to turn us into Goim with guns and tanks, and now the best air force in the world. Hashem doesn't need all of that. When the time comes, he will bring us into Israel, all the anti-Semite Nazis and all other Goim that hate us, Hashem will wipe them out, like all the prophets already told us, and we will form this, the state of Israel in a kosher way, and we'll build the third temple and everything will be perfect. Until then, it's illegal to go back. The time did not arrive, we're still in exile. Other Jews, what they call themselves religious, they say no. Even though they are wicked, we all have the same cause. We all want to go back to the Holy Land. We want to learn in Jerusalem. We don't want to learn in Czechoslovakia, or in Poland, or in Russia, or in Lithuania, or in the Middle East. We want to go back to Israel. We want to live in the Holy Land. How many years are we going to suffer? 2,000 years we waited already. So they, they said there are proofs in the Tanakh that Hashem brought salvation to the Jewish nation through wicked people, like the four people with the leprosy, that, that they were putting them in isolation. And they're actually the one who found out where the food is and saved everyone from starvation. So you find that sometimes Hashem actually does something good to the nation, dafka through wicked people. So they joined them and the rest is history. Now you see today what happened. They destroyed Judaism, they destroyed the Yeshivot, they destroyed the Torah, they made Israel a state of Goim. And there's really, besides the Haredim in Israel, the regular people, the secular people, have zero Judaism in them. Nothing. It's, it's, a, 
it's ממש unbelievable that they still have mezuzah and circumcisions of the baby. That's probably, that's it, just about it. And even now they talk about stopping the, the circumcision and some of them don't even put mezuzah anymore. That's really what's left from them. Everybody is totally lost. Not only they're not religious, they really very much hate the religion. They brainwash them in such a way that they're so allergic to the religion that they became violent. Meaning when they see a religious person, they want to slaughter him. That's how much they hate them. Just like the Hamas wants to kill a Jew, or the Nazi want to kill a Jew, there are two and a half million Israelis that would be very happy to press on the bottom and wipe out all the religious Jew in a minute. And it's not an exaggeration. How do I know it? Very simple. You see who they vote for the, in the election. If there is someone comes on a commercial and say, give me the power to close all the yeshivot, to, de to, to destroy Shabbat, to make public transportation on Shabbat, to force the religious people instead of yeshiva to go to the army, to make uh, all marriages legal, to help assimilation, to make gay marriage, to do all these things that is against Judaism, and three million people vote for this kind of people, you, you see what they think about the religion. So therefore, they're very allergic to religion. This is what happening today, 70 something years, after this Reshaim Arurim, this Tzionim, they started the State of Israel. You see that Rav Yoel Misatmer was one million percent right about everything he said. However, up to now, every normal person understands that's the case, there's nothing to deny. However, the question now, if someone made a lot of mistakes, one mistake after the other for seven years, or many, many mistakes were made. So the question now, what is the alternative today? When you speak to Satmer, some of them today say, it's still not legal to be in Israel, or to go there, or to live there, or to receive money from the government, or to support the army. They don't want to hear anything about Israel, and especially this government. I ask them, you're 100% right in your ideology. This is all wicked people, and we see what, how much they hate Hashem and they hate the Torah. But what's the alternative? You want to throw 7 million Jews to the garbage? You want to give Israel to the Palestinian Nazis that they're going to slaughter all of us in a week? That's what they're going to do. What do you think? They care what the world's going to say? Give the Palestinian one week freedom. Now one of us would survive. They'll kill every Jew, every baby they'll kill. There's no doubt about it. Not even a tiny percent of a doubt. In a week they will slaughter all of us. They're not even hiding it. They're saying it to the face of the reporters when they report them. As soon as we will have the power, we will slaughter all of you. That's what they say. They're not hiding it. They're not politically correct. Every speech, that's what they say. We'll throw you to the ocean. So what are they suggesting? That now we're going to say, okay, the way was not good. We build a state with tens of thousands of buildings and an army and hospitals and highways and all kinds of things and a, and a network of spies all over the world of intelligence. So we're going to come to the Hamas and say, come, it's all for you. Just let, let us live here that, you know, if you should have mercy on us. What's the solution? The answer, there's really no solution. If you stop what you already started now, you'll all be dead in a month. That's what it means that you force Hashem to perform miracles for you, even though it wasn't his original plan. He didn't really want, but we are kind of forced him. So I once gave an example to a Satmer Hasid that have a good head on his shoulders. We go back and forth. I ask him, don't you see that Hashem made us a huge miracle on a six day war? In six days you defeated, it should have taken six years to achieve such an achievement and Hashem did it in six days. We defeated all the Arabs, they, were, they got the shock of their life. It's the biggest victory in modern history in any battle. Nobody understand today how the Israelis were able to defeat Egypt and Jordan and Syria and Iraq and in six days, wipe them out like this. 
So what does he say? No, it's not Sitracha. It's, that's what they say. It's Sitracha. The Satan has power, as you can see. He gives power to all kinds of wicked people. And what's the proof? When Moshe threw the cane, he became a snake. The Egyptians, filthy, impure, khartumim, such impure people, idol worshippers, they threw their canes and also became a stick. Hashem always balance. Balance the, the situation that you don't lose your free will. We will continue to argue probably until Mashiach come. Again, I'm 100% with them in their ideology. Every kosher Jew must have this ideology. She never kiss up to the wicked, never cooperate with them, never compliment them on anything. Just like the Ochot Tzadikim writes, this was written a thousand years ago, way before Satmer. Way before Satmer. In the Ochot Tzadikim was written a thousand years ago that you're not allowed to give one compliment to a wicked that goes against Hashem. One, even when he does something good. Read it in chapter 24, Way of the Righteous. Uh, the subject of that chapter is Hanufa. Hanifut, Shar Hanifut, kiss up. Are you allowed to kiss up to a wicked person when he does a mitzvah and he does something good? Read over there how severe it is. Anyway, Rabotai, so I told him, let's say there is a Hasid. He wants to open a pawn shop in Harlem. Pawn shop in Harlem. In Harlem, even though today Harlem became a fancy area, and there's, a build, there's apartments in Harlem that are worth 15 million dollars today. Beautiful penthouse. It's very expensive by the Central Park. Harlem is now what it used to be. That you can buy an apartment for 100,000 dollars over there. It's, these days are over. Today it's minimum seven, eight hundred thousand and up for an apartment. But I'm not talking about the value of the real estate. I'm talking about this fact that no Jews live there. There's no Jews. So now if a Hasid will decide to open a pawn shop in Harlem, is it good for his soul or no? There's no synagogue there. He won't be able to daven in Minyan. He won't be able to go to Shul to Mincha and Arvid. He's going to have to pray in a, sh in a place. Plus, there's probably many anti-Semites over there. And some of them could be dangerous. And they see him with his yarmulke and beard and peos. It's not exactly so great for him. Physically and mentally and spiritually. So he comes to the Rebbe. The Hasidim have a Rebbe, like a king. And he asks him, Rebbe... Tell me what should I do? Should I open a pan shop in Harlem or no? The Rebbe say, why can't you open in Flatbush? Why can't you open in Borough Park or in Monsey or in Lakewood? In the Jewish areas. Why do you need to go? No, but Rabbi, the, the big money is over there. People buy, buy gold, sell gold, buying all kinds of things, exchange. It's big business. What am I going to do here? So the Rebbe told him, no, you shouldn't open over there. It's not good for your soul. After a year or two, you become less and less religious until who knows what's going to happen. Do not do, do not open a shop there. And he ignored the Rebbe. He didn't listen. And he anyway went and invested $200,000 and he opened the pawn shop. And now he did it against the Rebbe's advice. And that was his life saving. It took him 20 years to save this $200,000 and he has 10 kids at home. 10 kids living with him in Williamsburg or in Borough Park. And now Hashem is facing two options. One is to teach him a lesson. You don't listen to the Rebbe, to the Torah. You're going to lose all your money and one anti-Semite guy will break your bones over there. Next time you should listen to the Rebbe. But what's going to happen? There are 10 innocent children who will starve to death. What did they do to deserve it? Because they have a stupid father that doesn't listen and think he knows everything. So Hashem is actually forced to perform a miracle to this Hasid against his will. It wasn't Hashem's plan. He didn't want. That's why he sent him to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe warned him. And he, did, he didn't listen. He did it anyway. So Hashem is forced to send him good business to the pawn shop in Harlem. 
and a lot of guys coming and he makes business and he thinks this entire time ah, this Rebbe yeah, I'm, I'm smarter than him what did I even ask him? I should have not even asked look, I was right, not him I'm making over 100,000 profit a year I feed my family thanks to this shop one day when he dies, he's going to have to pay for all the miracles that Hashem had to perform for his family, although he was very upset with his choice. So here is an example how a person can force Hashem to do something that he was not interested to do. Sometimes a person can force Hashem to keep him alive, even though Hashem is very interested to take him away from the world. But right now Hashem cannot do it. Why? That person tricked Hashem in such a way that he really cannot take him away. Who knows what I'm talking about? Yeah? Learning Torah non-stop. Learning, uh, learning Torah non-stop. Eventually you have to go to the bathroom one minute. How long are you going to last non-stop? 24 hours? 48 hours? Eventually you have to eat something? You have to sleep maybe half an hour, maybe you have to get up to the bathroom. Someone will be attract your attention, you stop and you die there. Someone who's supporting someone else. Oh, you're getting close. When you make other people dependable on you, depend on you. For instance, let's say you support a yeshiva. There are 30 families there, kolel. You give each one of them a few hundred dollars a month, they sit and learn all month. If you die, 30 families are going to get hurt. It's going to ruin Hashem's plan right now. Because you feed them, you, you yourself could be wicked. You, you did many things that brought you the death penalty. There's a death penalty pending against you. Just like here in America, when they want to execute a person, if the court decides to give him the death penalty, sometimes they kill him 20 years later. Still waiting 20 years in prison until one day they kill him. Why they wait so long? Maybe the time in Shamayim did not arrive for this guy to die. Same thing over here. You can have a pending death verdict against you, but for now Hashem cannot do it because it's not good for the world. Or maybe because thanks to you a lot of Jews become Baalei Tshuva. And Hashem said, for now I cannot take him away. Why? It messed up my own will. My will is getting done through this Rasha, through this businessman, through this proud, arrogant person. Not everyone that has merit, it means he's righteous. It can be a guy that makes thousands of sins every month. All kinds of sins in his behaving, with his family, I don't know, in his arrogance. He could be violent. Maybe he's not the most honest in the world. Maybe he puts people down. Maybe he hurt people, who knows? Maybe he doesn't dive in Minyan. It could be many things. But he gives tons of money to charity. And millions of good things happening thanks to his money. Now we have a dilemma here. It's a dilemma. In one hand, every day he al he's alive, he gets Hashem angry with his actions, and he's talking, and he's Lashon Ara, and all kinds of other things he, he does. And at the same time, he makes Hashem very happy. Why? Thanks to him, a lot of Torah is coming to the world. Thanks to him, more and more souls are getting saved. It's a catch-22. What do you do? You understand? You know what? It's similar. It's similar to the CIA. CIA, sometimes they follow a big criminal. A hacker, he hack into banks, hack into the FBI, he can hack into an airplane and make the airplane fall into the water. He's a super, super expert. There's people like this, they can do anything they want. When finally the CIA catch them, they're supposed to go to prison for 30 years minimum. But they, 
they can't send them to prison as much as they hate them for all the crimes they committed. They really need people like this, like Oxygen, to fight other hackers. So they will always offer them a deal. We won't touch you as long as you work for us. Against terror, against other countries, against, uh, against all kinds of, you know, Iran, this, that. So you have many criminals who serve the CIA, meaning serve the United States. Many criminals. And you can touch them. Even though every day they still commit crimes. The CIA is not that naive to think that this guy will become a rabbi overnight. For now, he's helping the FBI, he's helping the CIA. They bring a lot of results thanks to his knowledge and connection or whatever. But at the same time, because he knows they can touch him, they need him, he allows himself to do all kinds of things, knowing, big deal, if they find out, what are they going to do? I've done a lot worse and they didn't do anything. When will the CIA will chop his head off? When he will stop to bring any help. We have no use for you anymore. That second, you will never hear about him again. Same thing with Hashem. As long as you bring positive things to, the, to my nation, to the yeshivot, to save souls, it's worth it for me, for the time being, not to execute you. Or not to make you sick in a hospital. Or not to discover all these things that you did. But when you stop with your charitable uh, activity, and with the other things that you help so many people, that second, your extension is expired on, on a spot. This is not my idea. This comes from a, one of the biggest rabbis of the generation, Rav Volbe. The tzaddik, Rav Shlomo Volbe, the writer of many books, among them Alei Shur, it's a very good book. I had, happened to be a good friend of his son. And his son told me that they have a lot of recordings from Rav Volbe that the world never heard yet. And writings that were never published. Maybe somebody will be smart and give some money and buy the rights. And publish it to the world because it's a treasure. It's very, very clever, similar very much to Rav Avigdor Miller Zatzal. We benefit so much from Rav Avigdor Miller, but Baruch Hashem, I had the school to publish Rav Avigdor Miller in the last 10 years, non-stop, every month, and it worked. All his books are sold out, and there's dozens of different books. It's hard to get. Many of them are out, 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 Baruch Hashem, a lot of people, it's more, it goes from more to mouth. Now in every synagogue you go, you see the, the Vrei Torah. Pamphlets, you know, in the Vrei Torah, in English, in Hebrew, in Yiddish. Baruch Hashem, this is uh, the greatest. You have such a treasure, you don't want to keep it in the closet. You want everyone to have, uh, you know, access to it. <coughs> so, going back to what I started with. <laughs> so there are two things Hashem hates. One, we just said, He hates to perform a clear miracle which it's obvious that is a divine intervention and uh, it has to, he has to go against the law of nature to save that person. When Hashem doesn't mind to perform a miracle, when it's involved with an extremely righteous person, such as Avraham Avinu, he took the sand, and through the sand, and the sand became weapon. <coughs> Arrows. And he was throwing it on the enemies when he got to the war. Him and Eliezer, two people going to fight the kings. For Av uh, Nimrod threw him into the fire. Avraham is in a furnace and he's not getting burned. For Avraham Avinu, one of the most important people in the history of the world, Hashem performed clear miracle. For Moshe Rabbeinu, Hashem performed miracles. For Nachum Ishgamzu, in the Gemara, Nachum Ishgamzu, blind, no hands, no legs, full of shechin, pass all over his skin, there's no hands to each. 
blind, laying in a bed, extremely poor. The whole house, any minute is about to fall. The house is shaking, you know, you hear the noise of the wood. Any second it's going to fall on your head, but for years, he doesn't fall. One day the Chachamim came and said, you cannot live in such a house, dangerous. We want to take you out of here. Say, okay, make sure you first go out and pull me. Don't stay inside while you're taking me out. Because as soon as my body will go un from under the roof, the building will fall. He already knew that Hashem is holding this building against the law of nature. There's nothing holding it besides a miracle. Just that he won't collapse on his head and kill him. But he knew that the people that carry him, they may not have that merit. So it's going to fall on the, the last person that still is inside the house when they carry the bed. If it will fall, he may get killed. So he said, no, no, you go outside and pull me outside. Meaning when I go out, the building will fall. And that's what happened. So Nachum Ishgamzu Hashem performed a miracle for him. Sometimes even in this generation, Hashem performs a miracle for a person. Like Rav Chaim Kanievsky. He was debating in, uh, to write an answer about the grasshopper. Some of them are kosher, some of them are not. We don't know. The Yemenites, they have a tradition. They were eating grasshoppers like french fries. Frying it in a pan and eating it. Tastes like french fries, one of them told me. It's not so bad as it looked. <laughs> I want to ask you, how much money are you willing to get in order for you to take these grasshoppers, you know, with these two things like these, two antennas? It goes like this, and fry him in a pan, and eat him. Wow. So I want to ask people over here, not Rav Shechter, how much money I will have to give you for you to agree to eat one grasshopper? Huh? I want to remind you, in China, they pay money to eat it. They eat everything that moves. They eat rats, they eat mice, they eat cockroaches, worms. They have a barrel full of all kinds of things that has those antennas. I saw in my own eyes. They come with a cup, the guy has a spoon, he puts it in a cup, they pay, they put it in their mouth, and you see the antennas <laughs> coming like this from, the, from Mr. Lee's mouth. <laughs> and he enjoy it. Ah, delicious. No. By the way, you may think, oh, that's a primitive Chinese. No, 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 no that's not a human being. Come on, who, what human being will eat this kind of thing? You'll be surprised. Maybe this Chinese is an engineer. Many of the electronic you have, he maybe invented it. If you still don't believe me, in Japan they eat the brain of the monkeys. Japanese are not stupid people, you know. A lot of them are very smart when it comes to inventions and stuff like that. They tie the monkey, they open up the head while he's still alive and eat the brain with a spoon. And also in China. No. Huh? No. One person told me that, you know, it's true what you say, but it's only in the barbarian primitive villages of Japan. Not in Tokyo. You won't find in Tokyo a brain of a monkey that people sit and eat. Maybe it's right, I don't know, I've I never been in Japan. I actually just got an email from Japan now, on my way here. Someone who becoming religious. Even in Japan, Baruch Hashem. Thank you for saving my life, changing my life. How can I get your books shipped to Japan? Huh? Maybe we can ask, maybe we can ask about the monkeys for someone that lives there. Anyway, you got the point. How much will you willing to receive to eat one grasshopper? Huh? Five thousand you eat? You're a brave guy, David. I had to give you that. Video shows one cow brings it in a little car, like a medicine bottle. He takes it. As he takes it, he brings the rock and fell on the floor. So you want to get his 
He zinked it up from the floor because he made the bra from now. Well, that I and mean, a. <laughs> anyway, so Avchaim Kanievsky didn't know which kind is the kosher one that we are allowed to eat. They say that it has the shape of a chet, the leather chet in a, in a stomach. So, as he's thinking which kind will be kosher, one of them landed on his tender in a yeshiva in Bnei Brak. What are the odds? How do I know this story is true? It's written in a book. Someone went to verify it with him on a video. On a video. Video can deny. Books, maybe someone forged it. But he asked him, Rabbi, is it true the story with the grasshoppers that you were not sure about which one is good? And one just came and said, Yes, it happened. He wrote a book about it. It happened. So that's an, a clear miracle from Shamaim that a grasshopper will come from Egypt into the standard of Rav Chaim Kanievsky in Rehov Rashbam in Bnei Brak. If it was us, what grasshopper will come from the south all the way to Bnei Brak for one of us? It will not happen. But for some people, Hashem performed miracles. Unbelievable miracles. So, but Hashem in general does not like to interfere with the laws of nature. And the Ramban say that every miracle that happen, it's better to translate it in a natural way. That's why Hashem, even when He performs a miracle, He does everything He can to hide it, that there will be a way to explain it in a natural way. For instance, the opening of the Red Sea. How can you explain it in a natural way? That the water opens up. What? The water came up. And you know, maybe, oh, there was very strong wind. Wind can split the water. What the Torah said that Hashem brought wind. What do you need the wind? Anyway, you open the water by a miracle. Wind. What do you need the wind? Why, why you have strong wind? To give an excuse to the wicked people to say, oh, it's not Hashem, it's the wind. And who brought the wind? <laughs> Let's say it was the wind. Of course, of course the wind is just a cover-up. But who brought the wind exactly when they needed the water to open? It's also a miracle. How many times you have such a wind? Once in 20 years? And it came exactly where you need it? The timing, you don't see the end of God? The wicked people see what they want to see, not what they should see. Why? Because when they see what they should see, it would interfere with their plan to follow all kinds of sins and uh, crimes. It's going to make them feel guilty. That's why they close their eyes when they want to ignore the reality, because they don't want to feel guilty. So let's conclude. <laughs> So, first, Hashem does not like to interfere with the, with the free will of the human being. And second, He doesn't want to perform a clear miracle. But sometimes Hashem does it as we say. For instance, who can give me an example where, when Hashem actually interfered with someone's will and action and forced him to stop? can give me an example in the Torah? Bilam, who else? Yudah and Tamar, how? Lavan, very good. Lavan is chasing Yaakov, very angry. Yeah, Lavan is on the way to hurt Yaakov, very angry. Yaakov took away all his uh, sheep. And he became very wealthy and he ran away. He ran away. Betzuel. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So Hashem comes to Lavan while he's chasing Yaakov and he say to him, do not dare to touch Yaakov and don't dare to speak to him. Don't dare to do, to do anything to him. Meaning, yeah, Lavan had one thing in mind. 
Bilam wanted to curse the Jewish nation. He was able to aim to the exact second per day that Hashem midat adin, the judgment is very strong. And Hashem, first he warned him, first Hashem told him, don't go with them. Don't go with the messenger of Balak. But then he saw that he's anxious to go because he wanted money. He was very greedy. So, okay, you want to go? Go! This is your choice? Okay, I cannot interfere with your choice, but don't dare to curse. That's already against me you're going. I'm warning you. So meaning you see that Hashem actually dictates for specific people not to do specific things. Another example is every leader of a country is automatically supervised by Hashem in such a way that all the personal choices that this leader makes, Hashem let it go. Whatever he chooses, he wants to eat non-kosher, Hashem allows him. Later he'll pay the price. But for now, no interference. He wants to speak Lashon Ara, Hashem doesn't interfere. He wants to break Shabbat, Hashem does not interfere. He wants to do good things. Hashem let him do whatever he wants, good or bad, until he makes choices that relates to the nation that he supervises. He's the head of a group, the head of the army, the head of a country, a big Rosh Yeshiva. Decisions that are affecting the public, Hashem interferes with those decisions more frequently. Why? Because it's not about you. We're talking about 70,000 people here will get hurt. Or 7 million people. Or 100 million people. So therefore, when you become in power, Hashem runs the show. Lev Melachim, Be'yad Hashem. The heart of the kings and the leaders are in the hand of God. Meaning, when you see someone like Ariel Sharon, you know Ariel Sharon? He was the Prime Minister of Israel. He was all his life an extreme right. He was very, very strong to the right. He was not a liberal, he was not a lefty. He was very anti-terrorism, very anti-Palestinian uh, murderers. All his life, a big warrior, a hero of war. His opinions were already well known. And all of a sudden, the last year of his life, before he went into coma, he became the biggest leftiest overnight went to sleep an extreme right. Imagine he went to sleep Donald Trump and woke up in the morning Bernie Sanders. If someone will tell you tonight Trump is going to sleep as an extreme righty Republican, anti-left and anti-liberalism, by tomorrow morning he will become Bernie Sanders. Would you put your money on it? Huh? Not possible, no? Is it possible that it will happen? Huh? Not possible. The answer it is possible. Why? Because when it comes to public decisions of all the community that you're in charge of, I force you sometimes to accept decisions. All of a sudden, Ariel Sharon gave the Hamas in Gaza all Gush Katif, the size of Brooklyn, almost. You know how, how many cities and how, how synagogues and houses and farms in order to receive nothing. They don't have to give anything. Here, take it. Let's evict the Jews from the homes, destroy the synagogue, destroy the farms, destroy the whole city, and we'll give it to you. How all of a sudden it became like this? On Rosh Hashanah, Hashem decided to punish us and we're going to lose another portion of our land. And he changed his mind overnight from an extreme right to the biggest leftiest. Why? 
I want to punish my children by taking away the land from them and giving it to these filthy murderers. How will I do it when the, when the right is in control? How will I do it? There are many ways to do it. How is a righty become a lefty overnight? He receive a check with a letter. If you will give Gush Katif to the Hamas, you will get 50 million dollars to any offshore account you want. Signed, Hussein Obama. That's it. Or it can be in a confidential phone call. Hey, Sharon, don't give us hard time. We want to do something for the Hamas to relax them. Don't worry, we will assure you they won't shot rockets. We are the Americans, we give you an assurance. Like it's worth less than a toilet paper, their assurance. We see how they promised Saudi Arabia and Husni Mubarak and many other promises they made and none of their promises ever kept. But they can, Hussein Obama could have called Sharon and said to him, don't give us our time, please. Give me an account, it's between me and you. No one will ever know about this phone call and even if you say about it, I will deny it. You just send me a bank account anywhere in the world. I'll make sure by tomorrow you have 50 million dollar over there to your name. Please sign the, the paper. That's it. That's how, they, that's how they do it. The next day, all of a sudden, he comes to the Knesset. We have to do something for the Hamas. Bush, <laughs> who cares? Bush, tree, whatever you want. <laughs> You got the point or no? That's how things done. That's how things done by the police. That's how they done in politics. That's, that's how they get done. So Rabotai, let's see. Every Jew has some difficult situations in his life. Sometimes harder, sometimes less. When everything works as, as planned, According to your plan, you're happy, things are working well for you, you achieve your goals. Obviously, it's very easy to be religious and to thank Hashem from the bottom of your heart. Why are you so religious? How can I not be religious? Everything I ever dreamed about Hashem gave me. A wife, children, money, health, good job, position. Everything I dreamed about, I achieved. How can I be ungrateful? It's very easy to be, to, when you read Tehillim with tears in your eyes, tears of joy. Very easy to be grateful. You, you basically have everything working for you. Let's see that you give Hashem the same performance and gratitude when everything works the opposite of your plan. You wanted to get married to this person, he didn't want you, or she. He wanted uh, this job, in the last minute someone pulled the trick, you lost it. You have pain, oh my God, I hope it's not cancer. From all the possible things, guess what? It is cancer. Oh, chemo, this, you lose your hair, you lose your beard. Everything goes the other way around. There are people like this. There are people like this. I hear from them how much they suffer. Just when they finish one problem, a week later they call, you think that the problem came back? No, this one is okay, now I have something new. Few months, another problem. Few months, another problem. Shem doesn't leave them alone. The question is, is it easy now to thank Hashem? This is what David HaMelech writes in Tehillim. Tehillim chapter 92 verse 3. להגיד בבוקר חסדך ואמונתך בלילות. To speak about your kindness in the morning, meaning when the sun is rising, when life is good, when you see the light. Light is happiness. Many people, when it's a sunny day, they're happy. When it's a cloudy, dark day, they depress. There's a special name for it, I forgot what it is. In days that it's cloudy and rainy and foggy, extremely sad and depressed. When the sun comes out, they come back to life. 
Why? The light brings happiness. Top. Lagid baboker chasdecha. When everything is shining and nice and rising for me, it's easy to talk about the kindness of Hashem and praise Him. Aval at night when it gets dark, when it's night is judgment. Morning, when the sun is rising, it's mercy. From sunrise to sunset, it's mercy in the world. From sunset to sunrise, it's judgment. That's why we don't say slichot after sunset. We wait until after midnight when the judgment goes down. It's a judgment time, right? Even when we pray, mincha, sometimes we are delayed. There's no minyan, you're waiting for the tenth one to show up. It's already 15 minutes past sunset. You still have time because you still see some light. But when you finish the Tfilat Shmona Yisrei, you cannot say confession and Yag Midot. Why? Because Yag Midot, you can only say in a time of mercy. Hashem, Hashem, El Rachum Vechanun, Erech Apayim Verav Chesed Vehemet. You're not supposed to say it when there's judgment. And once it gets dark, it's judgment take over the world. So, emunatcha balelot, when it gets dark and it's judgment and it's strict, everything's strict, everything is uptight, now you need emuna. It's easy to have emuna when everything's working well, when the millions are coming from all over, when everything you want happens right away, when you have messengers and servants and drivers and people do everything for you you basically have no burdens ah but when it gets dark when the government froze all your assets and all your friends turn their back to you and people that you fed for 20 years now pretend they don't know you when they see you on the street and your wife left you because there's no more money and even your children forgot who you are because you have nothing else to offer until now they milk you and now there's nothing to milk anymore so they found themselves another father now let's see how faithful you are to Hashem and how thankful are you able to stand while you dive and thank you Hashem I appreciate so much all these things you are doing to me Thank you that I lost all the money. Thank you that I lost this. Thank you that my children don't talk to me anymore. Thank you that I have pain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Are you willing to do that? How many people willing to do that? How many people are able to stand in front of Hashem and thank Him for becoming sick? Or for losing in a stock market a million dollars today? Chaz v'shalom, they have to go to a life, uh, life risk surgery. Oh, many other examples. How many people? Someone that is able to do such thing, then you know for sure is in a high level of righteousness. Who was like that? David Amelech. King David. The whole Tehillim is like this. What impressed me the most, personally, I mean, his level is beyond any understanding the level of his soul is beyond anything you can imagine anything you can imagine never in the history there was someone who was so in love with Hashem like David HaMelech Tzama Nafshi, my soul is so thirsty Leel Chai just to be hooked with you, to be connected to you never to leave the Torah I don't want money, I don't want wealth, nothing just to be attached to Hashem. But what's impressed me the most is when he was chased by King Saul and all his army and was hiding in caves. Imagine in the middle of the desert, you hide in some cave at night. Remember, there's no flashlight. You didn't have your iPhone that you can make some light. You are alone with snakes and scorpions and all kinds of wolves in a dark night no moon, no nothing and you have to hide in some cave you know how scary it is? I once, one time was at night in the desert we went on a trip you know how scary it is? I stand on some mountain in the middle of the desert but the wind is in your face and you feel like you are alone in a the world there's nobody there 
so scary. Imagine, and here at least you see, you outside, you see this, the, 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 the moon. Imagine you have to go into a cave now to sleep, in the sand, like a dog. And who are we talking here about? Who is the father of King David? The most righteous person in the world. Ishai. Your father is the most righteous person in the world. Never committed one sin in his entire life. And you have to now run for your life and an army is chasing you. So when he prays to Hashem, he doesn't say, save me from them. Make sure they don't find me. Have mercy on me that they won't know where I am. That they won't catch me. That they won't kill me. None of that. His prayer is, if I'm guilty, make sure they find me and give me what I deserve. And if I'm not guilty, please save me from them. I don't want any free gift. If I'm guilty, make sure they find me and kill me. I get what I deserve. If I earned it, I earned it. But if I'm innocent, please help me to get safe from them. How many people in the world you know, if any, that when they pray to God, Jews and non-Jews, and they know they're guilty of something, we're all guilty of something. He's guilty of stealing, this one guilty of that, this one guilty of that, everyone has something. So he prays to Hashem, if you find something in me that you don't like, please punish me ASAP. Do not spare any mercy on me. If I'm guilty of something, I want you to do what you need to do, please. Don't hesitate. Don't delay my punishment. Imagine a criminal that the police is chasing him and he stands and prays, Dear God, I'm hiding over here in a bunker. If you think I'm guilty with what I've done, it's against what you wanted, please make sure they find me. Let the police find me and arrest me. You have anyone like that or no? Did you ever find someone? All criminals, what they, dear God, I know I'm wrong, but you have to help me. I have no one else. Please help, mercy on me. Give me another chance. Make sure they don't catch me. Make sure they don't find what I did. Make sure there's not going to be any witness that coming. He's actually advising Hashem how to cheat for him. Cooperate with his scam. Who can raise his hand and say that every day is not like that? When you pray to Hashem about something specific, if you really analyze what you're asking, it's like asking your best friend to cover up for you and tell the police that uh, to give you an alibi. No, he wasn't there, he was with me. That's what you're kind of saying to Hashem. Blind the policeman. Make sure he doesn't see me. Make sure he doesn't ask for this and that. If, not, if he asks for that, I'm finished. So you're basically asking Hashem to help you accomplish your crime. Right or wrong? Right or wrong? Good, everyone agree? Oh. Moshe and Aaron in this parasha on Shabbat, they got a heartbreaking punishment. Really, it breaks the heart to see. They gave their life for the nation. They're much like babysitter. They took care of them. They got tons of complaints. People rebel against them. People made up lies against Moshe especially. All kinds of lies. It's, embarrassed. it's, it's embarrassing to even say what they published about him. After all he's been through, remember he was born as a prince in the palace of the most powerful person in the world, Paro. The richest and the most powerful person. Being a prince in Egypt of those days. What else do you want from life? Well, what do I care about these Hebrews? No, but they are your nation. I don't have anything to do with them. I was neglected in the, in the Nile when I was a baby. And I was adopted by Paro and his daughter. 
and I raise as a prince, and that's my nation. No, but, but your DNA belongs to this nation. Who cares? So what? Because they suffer, I have to go join them? I have to go and protect them? I have to go and help them in, uh, in their slavery? No! I enjoy my massage, the sauna, the boating, you know, nice art, walking in the street and one bow down to me as a prince, right? When the time comes to get married, 5,000 Egyptian uh, Cleopatras, they're all waiting online. Moshe, take me. What do I need to get myself into all this headache? Because I'm righteous. I can see people suffer and walk around like it's not my problem. It's called in the Torah, Nose Ba'ol Im Chavero. Nose Ba'ol. All means weight. Your friend is carrying a heavy bag on his head and he's barely walking. Run! Help him. 50% on your shoulders and 50% on mine. The donkey of your friend collapsed. The bags fell on the floor. Run to help. Help him to lift the, the donkey. Help him to load again everything. <coughs> Cannot ignore. The Torah has specific instructions. So Moshe and Aaron, Hashem said to Mo Now listen carefully to this. Hashem is actually tricking Moshe. Why Hashem trick a person? Especially the one he loves the most in the world. Who does Hashem love more than Moshe in the whole world? No one. It's, it's obvious. The Torah is named after him. Zichru Torah Moshe Avdi. Torah Moshe. It doesn't call Torah Yitzchak or Torah Avner or Torah David. Torah Moshe. The Torah of Moshe. But I want to ask you, if you love me so much and you send me on a mission, I'm your servant. I'm working for you. I am doing for you and you know I'm doing it from all my heart. Why you are tricking me? And then punishing me for falling into that trap. How did Hashem trick Moshe? Who knows? Hashem sends Moshe to get water out of the rock. There's no water, there's a drought. Everybody complained there's no water. Hashem say, you're going to get the water from the rock. This is the rock, gather everyone, speak to the rock and the rock will give water. Where is the trick? Huh? Take the stick. Why do you tell him take the stick with you? If Hashem did not tell him to take the stick, none of that would have happened. Take the stick, my, my understanding was that the stick has something to do with this mission. You're tricking me, you're misleading me. Tell me, take the, take the stick. What, do, why not, what am I supposed to understand? That in case I need help from that stick... Yeah! Wait, wait, wait. It gets better. Listen to this. <laughs> it's written in Parashat Vezot Aberacha. Ule Levi Amar. That's the blessing that Moshe gave to all the tribes. It's all come from Hashem. It's prophecy. Ule Levi Amar. And the tribe of Levi got the blessing. Tumecha veurecha leish chasidecha. מה זה תומך ואורך? אורים ותומים. אורים ותומים was a board that is hanging on the chest of Aaron with 12 precious stones, each stone for one tribe. And there were miracles performed. Hashem spoke to the nation based on those stones. They light, they shine, they get answers. Why Aaron had the merit that this will be on his heart? Because his heart was so pure, his heart was so clean, his heart was so righteous, and Hashem say, everything that I do is measure for measure. You have a clean heart, the most important thing now in the world is this, orim vetumim, the choshen, it will be on a pure heart. It cannot be on a filthy heart of a rasha. It must be on the heart of a tzaddik. So Aaron, 
is a tzaddik or rasha? Big tzaddik. So why is getting punished not to enter Israel? He got a punishment not to enter Israel. Why? You're going to find out why. Moshe was a tzaddik or rasha? Big tzaddik. Hashem never changed the name of the Torah after he punished Moshe if Moshe was Rasha. Chas v'shalom, if Moshe would go and murder someone, the Torah would still name Torah Moshe? No. Hashem would have to change the Torah. I'm sorry. Moshe did something horrible. The Torah cannot be named after him. Would have to change a lot of different things in the Torah. All the compliments he gave. None of that applies anymore. Wow, well, you can become a criminal in an hour, in a minute. In a minute. A person can be righteous 80 years. And then in a moment of stupidity can do something terrible and lose all his righteousness. In one sin. One terrible sin of Avodah Zarah, let's say. Let's say he saw an idol and bow down to an idol. 80 years is a big tzaddik. The chief rabbi of the world. One minute he bowed down to some idol, and that's the end of him. He cannot be called a tzaddik anymore. Can you call a tzaddik to someone who bowed down to an idol? One guy, one Persian guy from LA, is renovating his house. He's renovating his house. So for the time being, he has to be a few weeks by his in-laws, the parents of his wife. And the parents are not religious. You know how difficult it is when a religious couple have to live by in-laws that are not religious. It's a big conflict. Conflict, different ideology, every little thing can turn into a heated argument. In one hand, you have to be grateful. I mean, you know, they save you thousands of dollars on to, to live in hotels with your children. It will cost you fortune. It's not convenient. Here at least you have a kitchen. You can do things, you can eat, you can, you know, you have a nice bed. On the other hand, they pick on you and they make fun and they don't like the religion and they have comments and things that they don't understand, they don't understand that it's their ignorance. They just think that you're fanatic and crazy. Imagine now you are the son-in-law and you find out that your mother-in-law just bought two statues of Buddha in Machshimo. Buddha, idol, the idol of the Buddhist. And she puts it in a house. Two idols, Jewish woman. She went out of the house. The tzaddik took the two idols and smashed them. The mother-in-law came back and she saw what happened to, their, to, their, to, their, to her gods. She went crazy. She went crazy. If there was tension before, imagine now. So people started to attack this guy. Shame on you. That's what the religion calls for. How do you dare to do such thing? You guess there. Now I want to ask you a question. According to the Torah, this person did what he was supposed to do, or he actually committed a sin? Was this a mitzvah or a sin? Huh? So he went to one university rabbi. They always tell you the opposite of what Hashem wants. Remember, university rabbi, whatever they tell you, do the opposite. Remember this. Be careful not to fall into the hand of these modern academic that they teach Torah like it's a history, or like the Torah is math, or geography. You gotta be very, very careful. People that were not seriously in serious yeshivot, not attached to big tzaddikim, the Torah came from academic sources, full of kfirah and heresy. So he went to one of them, and he said to him, you didn't have an obligation to get rid of the Avodah Zarah. It's none of your business. This obligation exists only in Israel. Did he tell him the truth or no? Partially. Partially. 
The obligation to get rid of the Avodah Zarah that Hashem told to the Jewish nation is when they enter Israel, there were seven filthy nations over there, all idol worshippers, the Knanim, the Amorites, all these nations, they're all idol worshippers and Hashem hated them. And Hashem said, make sure you purify the land by destroying their idols, dig the foundation out. Make sure no idols remain in the land. And any Gentile that would insist to continue to serve his idol, you give him a warning. If he doesn't want, you kick him out of Israel. If he doesn't want, you kill him. But you do not leave any idols in the land. You don't want to execute them right away. You give them an option to be righteous Gentile, to destroy their idols, keep the seven laws of Noah, of the Gentiles, and be righteous Goyim, and I can live in Israel. There's no racism and no discrimination. This is the house of God over here, the Holy Land. You do not bring fake gods. You insist, we will destroy them. And you have to go and do it somewhere else. Meaning, if they go to a different country and do it over there, it's not our obligation to chase them and purify the whole world. We don't have an obligation to go to China and destroy all the, the temples of Avodah Zarah of Tibet and Thailand and all the other places. It's not our problem. We don't have to go to the whole world and destroy all the Christian churches, which is the places of Avodah Zarah. It's not our obligation. It's not even realistic. It's not even possible, even if we want it. That's not our obligation. Our obligation Clean the bed from among you. However, when it comes into a house of a Jew, not a church on the street or in Fifth Avenue or in a park, in the house of a Jew, and you are there, you must rebuke that Jew. And you have full permission to destroy the idol even without his permission. And if he takes you to bed in, because the idol costs him money, you are free and clear. You're not guilty. You don't have to pay him anything. It's not gezel. You did not hurt any property. But not only idols. If you buy dirty magazine, your friend, your roommate, you have a roommate, and you're religious and your roommate is not. And he ordered dirty magazines with all kinds of terrible things in it. You're allowed to get it when it arrives from the mail and destroy it before he even finds out. And it's not gazelle. It's costing twenty dollars, doesn't matter. Why? He will thank you a billion times in Olamaba for destroying it. Because the more he would look at it, the more hell he will get for it. And believe me, one hour in hell is worse than all the suffering of the worst person in the world. Seven years of suffering of Eov, Job. All his children die, lost all his money, sicknesses, all his friends left him. His life was completely destroyed. Seven years of suffering like this, the Ramban writes in the introduction of his legendary book, Shara Gmul. 70 years of non-stop tortures is not equal to one hour in hell to the wicked Jews. One hour. Believe me. So that person, oh, oh, oh how much he's going to thank you for destroying it. This mother-in-law, oh, 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 how much he's going to thank that son-in-law for destroying those Buddhas. But we live in a world of a lie. Over here people are stupid and ignorant. And what's right, it's wrong. And what's wrong is right for them. Everything by them is the opposite. Add on top of it that they finally agree to come to ask some rabbi what to do. Who do they go to? To some reform or conservative or modax. Yesterday I said in my lecture, there's some community, modax. You know what's modax? Modern orthodox. The word orthodox accidentally came into the term. They have no connection to orthodox. But modern, they're very modern. So I tell you what, there is a community somewhere here that they wanted to make Sheva Brachos. To who? To two gays. Two men that got married. 
They want to do it in a modern Orthodox synagogue. But the rabbi over there, that is also very modern. How you become a rabbi in such a place? You have to be extremely modern, meaning you have to come from the university. If you came from a good yeshiva, no one will hire you. You can be a doctor or something like that, they'll take you. Or scientist, or you know, liberal, democrat, or you gay yourself, then they'll take you. But if you're none of the above, no modern place will ever hire you. They're looking for people to cooperate with the crimes. So, the rabbi over there realized that even us, the modern people, it's too much. It's a big Chilul Hashem to do party in a synagogue to two people who, who rebel against Hashem in such an open way with no shame. He, he refused to allow it. And what happened to him? He fired him right away. Fired him right away. That's what happened to Hur. You know Hur? Hur was the son of Miriam. Miriam, she's the sister of Moshe and Aaron. She's a prophet. She had a righteous son, Hur. When Moshe went up to the mountain, he had Hur and the Erev Rav, the Egyptians that Moshe took out of Egypt, that they were cancer in the heart of the Jewish nation. These Egyptians, idol worshippers. Until today we suffer from them in every generation, the Zohar said. All these liberal Jews, Bernie Sanders and uh, the Schumer and all these people, they're all Erev Rav. As soon as they hear about God and religion, you have to see how they're allergic to it. They just cannot hear it. Forget about not to practice religion. If they see someone is observant, it drives them crazy. You see, the world is full of wicked people. But not every wicked person is an Erev Rav. Some wicked people are full of desires. How do you know who is an Erev Rav? Someone that dedicates his life to fight religion. Make websites, fighting all the time, making fun at religion, making sure religious people will never be able to perform anything, take them to court, resist a synagogue opening, all kinds of people like this. These are the Erev Rav. All these lefties, pro-Hamas, pro-gay marriage, pro-closing all the yeshivot, those are the Erev Rav that continue to re re be reincarnated every generation, they keep coming and destroying everything for all of us. Even today, they sit in the Knesset, you see them. And the Zohar said that before the Mashiach will come, they will control the land. And you just saw a perfect example in the last year, what they have done in one year. Such a damage, it will take 200 years to fix that damage, in one year. Destroyed everything. So, if it's what? Louder. If someone found a tray for food in the refrigerator, I might as just take it and just let it go to the dessert? If it's tray for food, it depends. If it belongs to a guy, it's a guy. To a Jew? You're allowed to destroy it. Why? If you see a Jew is about to eat Trefa and you knock it down on his hand on the floor, you have to pay him for the food? Why? What's his source? Huh? Man lose money. He brings money. I can argue with him about this. In Avoda Zara, there's no argument. But those magazines also have value. And I can show you that the poskim write that you have to destroy it, not just that you're allowed to destroy it. By the way, in Israel, there's Psak al if someone walks with iPhone on the street, if you take the iPhone from his hand and smash it, it's $1,100, he cannot sue you in bedding. That's much more expensive than that sandwich. So whatever he says, it's incorrect, with all due respect to him. It's incorrect. I went to Rav Ovadia Yosef, <laughs> Zatzal. I had such a video. Ah. 
I took a guy with me. I said to him, when I come to Rav Ovadia, and he began to give me all the smacks, that's it. It was already very old. It was a few months before he passed. That's my chance. I'm in Israel now. And I'm going in. Make sure you film everything. Be ready. So just when I go, and I look at him, he stood like this. No. Like this. Oh my God, what's going on here? I come out and say, Ma, Ma kara lecha? Why didn't you feel? I was afraid to take out my iPhone. <laughs> They'll kill me over there. <laughs> I say, you fool. You didn't know that before we went in. <laughs> you should have said, we'll bring the video camera. And I have it in the car, my video camera, in the trunk. I come with the video camera. Why didn't you say? <laughs> I forgot totally that in Israel, if you go in an ultra-Orthodox area with an iPhone, wow, they look at you like you're some kind of a murderer. Not only that, Rav Chaim Kanievsky, I believe it was him, I believe it was him, was posek that someone that has a smartphone is not kosher to sign on a ktuba. Pasu le'edut. If he doesn't have a, a kosher phone phone with internet, with no filters, with no... Somebody like this cannot be a witness in a wedding. My mom used to send us stories. My mom used to send us stories. They tried to get him up to be a witness. He took out his phone. He didn't have a smartphone. My mom used to. My mom used to. My mom used to. What did he say? He said it was at a chassidish wedding and they told him that he can't be an aide. He didn't have a beard. He said he probably had a smartphone. He took out his phone. He said he didn't have one. <laughs> you heard that? <laughs> Let's repeat it for those who didn't hear. Rav Wallenstein Zatzal, he went to a, a wedding and they asked him to be a witness. So now he didn't have a beard. So the Hasidim over there, they said, with all due respect, <laughs> we cannot let you be a witness because you probably, if you don't have a beard, you probably also have a smartphone. So he took out his kosher phone. <laughs> Sometimes you assume too much. Tof. One thing I will, I will probably, know, without knowing who those people were, something inside me tells me that he had more merits than all of them combined <laughs> in Shamaim. But leave it alone for now. So, we'll move on. So, so the Urim and Tumim was on the chest of Aaron. So Aaron was a tzaddik, and Moshe was a tzaddik. So why Hashem was so harsh with them and didn't let them enter Israel? When they told, when they told, when Hashem told Moshe to take the cane, the stick with him, and now he goes into the rock. Now came the moment of Moshe Rabbeinu's life. The moment that until today, I have no doubt that in Shamaim he still eats his heart for that moment. Because that's the moment that made him not go into the Holy Land. That was the dream of his life. He never entered the land. Why he didn't enter the land? When he was on the way to get them water from this specific rock, all the liberal Jews showed up. All the Democrats came. Bernie Sanders, Schumer, Fish. What's his name? Fish? Fish? Schiff. 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 Fish. Fish. He wished to be a fish. Fish is the Gilgulim of Tzadikim. Ken, Bennett, Yair Lapid, Avigdor Lieberman, all of those lefty liberals, haters of Hashem, and Moshe, they all showed up. Data, Naviram, all of them. What? Moshe, you want to get us water from this rock? <laughs> We're not impressed. You want to impress us that you perform a miracle? We'll make a deal with you. Let's see you getting us water from this rock, not from this one. Moshe said, what's the difference? This one, you shepherd, you probably know the lake, maybe the spring water under there. You're going to move it, it will explode. I'm sure you did some kind of a trick here. 
if you get us water from that rock, then uh, we have nothing to answer. But from this rock, we already tell you right now that it's not going to impress any one of us. So Moshe thinking, for Hashem, does it make a difference, this rock or this rock? Anyway, it's going to perform a miracle. It's not going to make a difference. If I'm going to get them water from this rock, anyway, no one will be impressed. We lose the effect of the miracle. Let me get them water from that rock. What's the big deal? Moshe came to the rock they suggested, and Aaron is standing next to him, and he has the cane in his hand. And Moshe began to speak to the rock. And the rock is not reacting. Nothing is happening. And everybody started to laugh. All these Rishayim, they're laughing and laughing. Ha, 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 you see? It's all a trick. He's a magician. Now Moshe is fuming. Not for his honor. He was the most humble person in history. Humble people don't care that people make fun of them. It wasn't about his ego. It hurt him that what Hashem wanted to, to do did not work. He realized that something is not right. He took the, rock, the cane and hit the rock hard. Few little drops started to come out. Tick! Another one. Then Moshe hit the rock second time. Boom! Explosion of the Niagara Falls. Big amount of water for millions of people. All river. Everyone was silent. They didn't know where to hide from the shame. The problem is that for one minute there was Chilul Hashem. One minute. But everybody laughed at Hashem and at his, and its messenger. That one minute that all these hundreds of Rishayim were laughing and making fun caused Moshe and Aaron not to enter the land. After performing so many good deeds and give their life for the nation and being extremely righteous and perfect personality and so much suffering for the cause one minute, one tiny mistake an extreme terrible punishment that affected them for eternity until today they suffer from that minute even though they're in the greatest place in heaven but remember, they are in heaven knowing that they never actually walked on the land the next time they will walk on the land will be when Mashiach comes, after that, the resurrection of the dead. But until then, Moshe that was so anxious that he begged Hashem, let me enter Israel as a cow. I'll eat some grass, someone will slaughter me and eat me for Yom Tov or Shabbat. At least I walked a few steps on the land, or make me a bird, or anything. Just let me enter, or let me enter one day, and then you take me away. You see how anxious he was? 515 prayers he prayed for that cause alone. He shook the heavens. The angels were shaking. They begged Hashem, you have to put an end to it. He is going to destroy all the upper worlds with his prayers. And that's when Hashem had to say to Moshe, stop praying, Ravlach, you have enough. Ravlach means you have plenty. You okay, don't worry. Stop. Do not talk to me again about entering Israel. What does it mean, Rav Lach? You have more than enough. What do you need to go to Israel? I don't get it. What does it mean, Rav Lach? I have many different things, but that's the one thing I want. The fact that I have other things, how does it help me with this? I'm talking to you about something I don't have. Imagine someone has a lot of money, has the greatest wife, has great health, has a great position, but doesn't have kids. 20 years, no kids. He's praying and begging Hashem for a child. And Hashem says, enough, you have plenty. Well, you have millions, you have cars, you have a wife, you have a job. You have... What one has to do with the other? 
I'm not asking you for money and more things that I have. I'm asking you for the thing I don't have. So, what, so how is Hashem answering him, you have plenty? All the mitzvot that you perform in Eretz Israel is the majority of the mitzvot of the Torah you can only perform in Israel, not in exile. So there was no chance to even perform those mitzvot yet. So what does it mean, uh, Rav Lach? Give me uh, about three, four months to live in Israel. I'll do masrot, I'll do trumot, I'll do all the mitzvot that, uh, that connects to Israel. And then you take me. Oh. So Hashem told us something very interesting here. When I say you have plenty, what does it mean? You are the teacher of all these people. This is the new generation who was born in a desert. Remember. Or this is right before the end. All the people that came out of Egypt, they all died. There were 600,000 men between age 20 and 60. 585,000 of them died already. There was only 15,000 left. The last Tisha B'Av, they're going to die. Every year on Tisha B'Av, 15,000 died. Everybody laid in a grave, they dug a grave. They're waiting until the end of the Tisha B'Av. And they don't know if they come out of the grave or not. If they didn't die by the night, they come out, they have one more year to live. Next year again, like this it was for 40 years. So that means all the people over there right now that entering Israel, they were all born in a desert. Nobody came out of Egypt and entered besides Yoshua ben Nun and Kalev ben Yefune. Two people. Everybody else died. The people that were born in a desert, who is their teacher? The rabbi, Moshe Rabbeinu, is the teacher of all of them. He taught them the Torah. Now they're going to enter to Israel, they'll build the temple, they will do the Masrod, they'll do the Trumot, they'll do all the things that connect to the Holy Land. When you, learn, when you teach someone else to do a mitzvah and he performed that mitzvah, the reward goes to your account like you did it. So your students are like your teacher, like your children. So you, you are okay, you are all set. You don't need to go to Israel. They will go and they will do everything and whatever they do anyway goes to your account. Don't disturb me anymore. But after all, what was the punishment for? For the one minute Chilul Hashem. Okay, that's Moshe. But why Aaron? What Aaron did? He was just standing there. When Moshe changed from one rock to the other, Aaron should have stopped him right there. Hey, brother. Hey, bro. What's going on with you? Hashem said to speak to this rock. Then they would have an argument. Moshe would say, but you see that they're not impressed. I want to do big kiddush Hashem. Does it make a difference for Hashem this rock or this rock? If you think that for Hashem it's easier to get water from this rock than this one, that's heresy. I'm not a, I'm not a heretic. So for me, I don't see a difference, this or this. I'm going to make it better than the way Hashem wanted. Better. Oh. So Aaron didn't say anything. Okay, now when Moshe hit the rock for the first time, when he spoke to another rock, nothing happened. Aaron should have told him, you see? You did not do what Hashem said, but he didn't say anything. Once he hit the rock for the first time, that's already another step against what Hashem told him. When he was about to hit the rock for the second time, that was Aaron's last chance to rebuke him and stop it. Should have held the cane and said, no, I'm not letting you hit the rock one more time. Why? Because Hashem never told you to hit the rock. You are now changing the whole instructions. And that's when Aaron got punished because if you do not rebuke someone that commits a sin next to you and you don't stop it, it counts like you did it. You understand? And that's why I disagree with what you said in the name of the rabbi. 
Because if someone is about to hit M and I don't knock it out of his hand and I don't rebuke him, at least try to rebuke him, it counts like I ate it. He say you have to pay him. I saw in other books you don't have to pay him anything. He has to thank you for saving his neshama. But it's okay. We can argue about the money, if yes or no. That's not so relevant right now. One thing is you are obligated to stop a Jew from committing a sin. Rav Yoel Misatmer, we mentioned him before, in Hungary, they, they, were, they are going to perform a not modest wedding for the first time. Men and women would sit mixed. No one would ever dare to do such thing. No one. Rav Yoel Misatmer found out, I told you he was zealous to Hashem, he went there and stood by the gate. They didn't invite him, of course. They don't want a fanatic rabbi to come and ruin the party. So they were hoping he won't find out. But he did find out. And he went there and stood by the door. And everyone who came said, shame on you. Just like Mordechai was standing by the entrance to the party of Achashverosh and tried to rebuke the people and nobody, nobody cared and they walked in anyway. And Hashem decreed a holocaust on us because of that. Same thing over here. Rav Yoel Misatmer was standing and screaming. And people didn't care. Rabbi, come on. I mean, it's a new world. Don't be so old-fashioned. It's no big deal. Look, all the women here are dressed modest. Uh, it's 80 years ago. Everyone was dressed modest. Even the Mechalelei Shabbat. No, no one would dare to dress not modest, a woman. I have videos from 1933 in Hungary, how they dance hora, Man, woman, man, woman, in a circle. You have to see the women, how they dress. The, the size of the, of the gown that they were wearing maybe was five feet wide. You know those gowns? You cannot see any shape of a body. Everything covered. They are eating treif and mechalelei shabbat and hugging men. But nobody ever dreamed to dress up, to wear a pants or short sleeves like girls dress today. It's not even an option. So they all come in a mother's clothes and they're going to see it in a mix. Then in a mix, I don't think there's going to be a mix, a mix dancing there. But Raviol Misatmer, it's enough that men and women will be mixing their wedding. And he started to scream and demonstrate. When the father of the Khatan, a very rich man that owned a big printing house, printing factory, found out that the annoying rabbi is standing by the door and trying to tell people not to enter his son's wedding, he came out, hey rabbi, to the best of my knowledge you were not invited over here. Who invited you over here and not only you're not invited, you're also telling people not to come in. What is it your business? So Rav Yoel Misatme realized there's no one to talk to, so he told him one sentence. He told him, no problem, I will go. But if you're not going to stop this Chilul Hashem, I, if I would be you, I would be very worried that you will not make it another day. Meaning, like tomorrow you'll be dead already. <laughs> okay, okay, enough, enough. You're intimidating me, you know. Don't be judgmental. You know these people, Rabbi, why? I tell you something, you know, the people today are so ignorant that you don't know if to laugh or to cry. The first minute you want to laugh, then you realize instead of laughing, you should cry. A few years ago, there was a girl in uh, Rishon Lezion in Israel named Meital. Meital. Meital is going to get married to Mahmoud. Not only she's not ashamed, they send invitations, wedding invitation. Metal u bechir liba Mahmoud. No shame. So I took a picture of that invitation, I put it on my Facebook page, and I wrote, one line, there is no more shame. People used to have shame for intermarry. The shame is gone. That's it. I didn't write they should die. 
that you should get punny, nothing personal. I just put a picture of the invitation and I wrote, there used to be shame and the shame is gone. That's it, in Hebrew. I have uh, in that page more than 100,000 people. Some of them are lefties, spies. They, they're in the page just to make sure if they can catch me saying something that they can right away tell, snitch to the reporters that they should go on television, right? That's how they work. Rav Ovadia himself, when he used to speak on Shabbat, he used to come with a tape recorder, one of them, smuggle in, record on Shabbat the drasha after Mincha, and the next day headlines in the newspapers all over. What was the topic of the... That's how they used to do it. So one or two or ten or twenty, who knows how many, reported me to Facebook as a racist. That I'm anti-Arabs. I didn't even care if he's an Arab or Swedish. <laughs> and I don't have anything against this Mahmoud. Don't even know who he is. I was talking about intermarriage, which is a sin from the Torah. A very big one. That's it. Mahmoud, Chris, Isaac, who cares? To be any guy. There's no difference. So they closed my Facebook page for a month, a month and a half. Shut me down. And there's nobody to talk to. They don't have customer service. There's no one to talk to. One day after Rosh Hashanah, I, I dove in so strong to reopen that page. One day after Rosh Hashanah, I said, let me check if the prayers were accepted. <laughs> Boom, I opened it up, it came back. Miracle. But that's the way they work. So, you said, Metal and Mahmoud, no shame. They publish an invitation. So one girl sent me a comment on a Facebook page. Rabbi, shame on you. From all the people in the world, I would expect someone like you to be the first one to congratulate them. I swear to you, that's what she wrote, this Israeli moron. Now I want to ask you now, should I laugh or should I cry? That we have people in our nation that are so dumb and ignorant that she doesn't even understand that is one of the biggest tragedies when a Jew marries someone from a different nation, it's against Hashem every second of his life. Nothing to do with the Gentile, it could be the most righteous Gentile. Nothing to, we're not talking about good one, bad one, it's not, no, not relevant. But for her to say she expects the rabbi to be the first one who congratulate them for committing such a crime. <laughs> That's what's going on here. Anyway, we'll finish the story and we'll finish right here. So, what happened after the wedding that night in Hungary? The rich man got a phone call from the printing house. You know, printing house work 24 hours. At night, they print the newspapers for the morning. One machine got stuck, and they have thousands of newspapers to print. They don't know what to do. We're very sorry to bother you on the night of your son's wedding. It's 1 a.m. We don't know what to do. We need you to come here and tell us what to do. He went with his tuxedo. He went to the printing house. And he put his head inside and was playing with the chains and, you know, all the... All of a sudden, he got caught in his uh, sleeve and the machine started to work, he was stuck. Pulled him inside and he came out from the other side. You know how you grind meat? That's how he came out. Now one inch stayed from his body. There's nothing to bury. The bone, he grinded the bones, the bones, everything. That's how bad is that machine, huge machine. That was the end of him. Why Hashem gave him such a punishment, and today thousands of people make such terrible, not kosher weddings, to the best of my memory, none of them got grinded by a printing machine. Right? They're alive and kicking. The answer is, now it's too late. What are you going to do? Kill thousands of people every week for doing this? 
It's not realistic. They'll get their punishment in hell. But that was the first one. It's called Poretz Gader, breaking the fence. You know how when you have a fence and people want to go into the theater or into the, into the football game and there's a, there's a wall and everybody try to get in and no one can get in. The one that broke the fence and because of that everyone went in is responsible for all the people that smuggled in. He has to get punished for every one of them. Because he's the cause that they broke in and didn't pay. And caused the owner of the place a financial loss. That's called Poretz Gader. Poretz Gader Ishachenu Nachash, the Gemara say. You go against what's accepted, you want to make a revolution, negative, against the Torah, against the Gemara, against the Shulchan Aruch, you want to become a reform, you inventing a new thing now, first one is responsible for everyone who will copy him. Everyone later on, he's going to get punished for every one of them. That's called Ishachenu Nachash. So, Rabotai, Aaron, Moshe said, Shimuna Amorim. Morim, Shimuna Amorim, meaning Morim is someone who mored, rebel. How do you say in English a group of people that rebel against Hashem? How do you call them? Rebels? Rebellions? Re rebels. Shimuna, listen you rebels. That's what Moshe said to them. Meaning he insulted them. Amina Sela Azen Otsilachemaim. You expect us to in plural. You expect us to get you water from this rock. He spoke in plural. That's another mistake he made. What does it mean we will get you water? Who, who are you talking about? You and Aaron? Where is God? In a picture here. I saw in one of the holy books, the Ben Ishchai brings right here, the Ben Ishchai, that every human being that give another Jew an impression that he can perform divine miracles on his own, and does not give the full credit to Hashem is a huge sinner. Of course, here Moshe never had any intention to say that it's him and Aaron. He obviously talked about Hashem, but he spoke Belashon Rabim, and Hashem got very upset. Now they begin to think that you and Aaron is performing this whole thing. That's why I always warn people not to worship rabbis. Many people worship the rabbi. I remember 22 years ago, one guy told me, I don't care, he's righteous, criminal, you can say whatever you want. If he tells me to eat pork, I eat, no questions asked. What is he? A complete idiot. If a rabbi tell you to eat pork, you know right away that this person is a criminal, not a rabbi. You don't need any more to check about him. If a rabbi say to you to do something against the Torah, that's a rabbi? That's a reform. Criminal. If a rabbi say to you, go steal, you're allowed to steal? The rabbi told me to steal. Not allowed. Don't hide behind him and say, oh, I listened to him. You're not a fool. If he said to you, go murder someone for me, you're allowed to murder? Go kill your parents for me, you're allowed to do it? Not allowed. You have to, Hashem gave us a sechel brain to think, not to be stupid. Being stupid, it's a crime. You must do everything you can not to be stupid. You act stupid, you're going to pay for it. Not allowed to be stupid. Hashem gave you a brain. That's why you always have to use the brain and investigate what's right, what's wrong, think, calculate, yes, right. So, Aaron got his punishment and he's silent. Two of his sons die, he doesn't make a beep. Over here, he doesn't make a beep. Aaron didn't say, but why me? I didn't need a rock. Not a word. When his two sons die, why? Why did they do? They were right. Nothing. Not one word. Vaidom Aaron. 
Do you know what level you have to be in that your, two of your four sons, you have four holy sons and two of them died in a second and get burned. Fire falls from heaven. Hashem burns your children in front of you. When? In the happiest day of the year. The grand opening of the temple. Everyone dance and happy and such a happy moment. Everybody waited for that moment. In a grand opening, two holy sons, like a line of laser, came from heaven, went into their nose, and burned everything from inside, and from outside they stay full. Their clothes did not even get burned. Why? Because they carry them. If they would get burned, there was nothing to carry. The Torah said after that they carry them from their clothes. How the clothes didn't get burned? Because Hashem burned them from inside, not from out, like a microwave. A microwave begins to cook from the center towards out. An oven cooks from outside towards the inside. The more it's inside, the inside gets harder. If you only put it one minute in the oven, only the outside get warm. When you cut the steak, inside it's still frozen. Microwave cook from inside out. It's different, different way. This is the, the greatness of Aaron. He gets the punishment and do, does not make a beep. Why a person is not judged when business is booming and he's thankful to Hashem. When he's just got married and he's thankful to Hashem. When he just have a child and he's happy and he's thanking Hashem. When he just make a lot of money, when his life just got saved from a horrible accident and he's thanking Hashem. <laughs> if someone does not thank Hashem when everything is right and working for him as a such an ungrateful creature, nothing to even say about someone like that. But if he does praise Hashem, he doesn't deserve that much of a credit. When you deserve a credit, when nothing is working, and you're happy. Nothing is working and you never stop smiling. You're always happy. That's not easy, you know. Because usually people, their mood is moving according to what they get or don't get. If they're disappointed, they're sad. If they're satisfied, they're happy. So it's like the stock market, up, down, up, down. The mood is changing according to what you get or lose, momentarily. Every 10 minutes the mood can swing. So, oh, you're so moody. Of course it's moody. When the stock is up, it's 10,000 up now. Ah, hi, hi darling, how was your day? Five minutes later, sleepy Joe come on the news. I'm not releasing any oil from the reserve. Ooh, shh. He's now in a negative 10,000. Why are you telling me about your business? Who cares about what? You just ask me how was my day. Ah, forget about it. Ah, his mood changed. Why? Now he's red, not green. <laughs> oh, all of a sudden something happened. He went up again. Oh, I'm sorry. I want to apologize for what happened. Doing it with people, as stupid as it is, we know that that's the way it is. But some people are actually doing it with Hashem. The day that things booming for them, they pray with such devotion, tears of admiration. When they have a bad day, ah, I don't have cheshek to put filin to the rabbi. Believe me, today I didn't put filin. Why? I wasn't in the mood. Why? Yesterday I got arrested. No, Seder, now you're free. I wasn't in the mood to pray. That's not a tzaddik. That's, we call it in Hebrew, interessant. You know what it means, interessant? He has an interest. And only when his interest is match, is positive. Things don't work his way, you don't want to be around him. That's a rasha, that's not a tzaddik. We learn from our own, doesn't matter what happened, I'm happy. I'm thanking Hashem. I'm grateful to Hashem. That's why the Hoshan will be on your heart. Because this heart is faithful to me. No matter what happened, is very, very faithful.
One more thing before we finish. Allow me to say a few words about red cow. Red cow is a very, very strong message to strengthen the faith, the emuna. Zochukat Torah. Don't look for logic. You won't understand the logic, the divine logic. Take a perfect paraduma, complete, not defected, not, nothing is missing. All the hair are red, with no exception. The Satan and the nations, the Goim, would come to the Jewish nation and make fun about this mitzvah. What is this? Slaughtering, burning, splashing on the impure people. Well, you're doing a lot of crazy things, you Jews. 200 years ago, we had a very, very special big tzaddik, Talmid Chacham, Rav Yonatan Eifshitz. Big, big rabbi. Even the Goim knew about him because he was so brilliant that even the Goim heard about him. When he was a child, they called him Yelet Pele, a wonder kid. He's so sharp that when you speak to him, he always make you feel like a fool, no matter how old you are. This kid was a, an exceptional. One time the king asked to bring the kid to him, the king of the Goim. Who is that Jew that everyone talks about him? I want to see him from close. So they brought him to the king. He's a child. He came to the, to the palace. The king gave him a tour. And then they came to, uh, to a room where all the idols were there. J.C. Penny, Maria, Jose, Carlos, all this Santa Di, Santa Dat, all the Santot, the room of the Santot. So he put them, he took him over there, and the king pointed one of the statues and said, No, what do you think about that statue? Jonathan, the boy, said, Your Majesty, my parents taught me that when I find, when I'll meet somebody important, I, will, I must be quiet and let him speak first. <laughs> Please tell the statue to speak, and then I can comment on what he said, but, you know. <laughs> The king wanted to test him before he actually entered the palace. He said, when the king asks where the room of the, the kid will ask where the king is sitting, he has to confuse you. Some of you have to tell him go to the right. Some of you tell him go to the left. Let's see if he will be clever to, to find on his own where the king is. So when he finally found the room of the king, the king asked him, how did you find my room? He said, ma perush. Why are you surprised? He asked him. I asked the guard, and the king said, and all of them told you the same answer? He said, no. Some of them told me left, some of them told me right. And how did you find me after all? He said, I followed the majority. I counted how many told me left, how many told me right. I followed the majority and increased my chances. So the king said, oh, very good, good point. So you see, Maybe you should join us, the Christians. After all, we are the majority, much more than Jews in the world. <laughs> so he answered him, you only follow the majority when you have a doubt. When the truth is crystal clear to you, you don't care about majority or minority. We don't have a doubt that Hashem gave us the Torah in a public event, and that's the only religion. You are busy with your nonsense. For us, it's not a doubt. Someone that is an atheist and he's trying to find a religion, he doesn't know Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism. He has five different ways. Oh, he has a doubt. Okay. We? We never had a doubt. And this is what he told him as a child. In Masechet Chulin, page 11, the Gemara brings a proof from red cow. Hashem said, take a red cow, red, complete. 
we can only see from the outside if it has anything broken or missing. Missing an ear, missing a lip, something, then it's defected. But how do we know inside nothing is broken? We didn't have MRI back then. There's no way to know. How do we know that the inside is complete? The Torah said that the, per the cow has to be perfect. How do we know it's not trefa? Maybe there's a hole in a lung. How do we know? And you may come and say, okay, after you slaughter it and all that, then you're going to check inside. No. You slaughter it, but you burn it as it, it's complete. You don't open it up. And so how do you know? So the answer is, reality is most animals are kosher. They don't have broken or holes or defects inside, defects. So we follow the majority. The majority of cows in the world are defected inside? No. 2% maybe are, 3% maybe are. That's it. The majority are by far healthy. The Torah say, follow the majority. When a Jew wants to do a mitzvah, who shows up always? The Satan, the Yetzirah. And he said to him, ah, what are you so excited? It's a small mitzvah. You think it's something important? Almost waste of time. A much better mitzvah than this. Why are you so excited? He's cooling him off. Yeah. So if the Jew is strong and he says, forget about this nonsense, I have to do it, that's what the Torah said to do, and that's it. What does the Satan come? As soon as he finished to do the mitzvah, the Satan shows up again. Wow, Ashrecha. Kol kavod, great. How great you are. You did not give up on the mitzvah. You are a real hero. And he thinks no one is like me in the world. <laughs> and Hashem cannot stand proud people. That's why we say every day when we pray, Aser Satan milefanenu umeacharenu. Please remove the Satan from in front of us and from behind us. I always wonder. It's just say, remove the Satan from our life. What does it mean? From in front of us? From behind us? Does it matter if he stabbed me from the front or from the back? The meaning of this verse is, before I do the mitzvah, the Satan is going to try to prevent it. After I did it, he's going to come and praise me. You're the best. No one is like you. Look at them. Look. No one is like you. You're special. Once you feel, yes, I'm special, you lost the mitzvah, you lost everything. You're full of ego. And Hashem cannot stand people with full, full of pride. So a person should not fall into that trap. King Solomon admitted that he understood all the secrets of all the mitzvot. All the reasons, all the secrets, everything. How many secrets and reasons you have for every mitzvah that Hashem gave in the Torah? Do you know? Every mitzvah in the Torah. Do you know how many reasons you have? I can tell you that today, at best case scenario, maybe we know three or four reasons. No more than that. But how many reasons really exist to every mitzvah? Do you know? 3,000 reasons. And King Solomon knew all of them. That's why some fools today, they say, ah, this mitzvah is not relevant today. No one is making medicine on Shabbat. You just take a pill that is already from the pharmacy, you swallow, and that's the end of it. But that's only one reason. Do you know all the other reasons? Why am I allowed to take pills on Shabbat? Some pills you're allowed to take, but just to give you an example. So King Solomon say, Amarti ech kama ve'irechokamimeni. As much as I dig inside, it's still very far away from me. It's in the book of Kohelet, chapter 7, verse 23. I thought maybe I can discover the reasons for this divine, uh, divine mitzvah, but I can't. The Chida is asking, 
many big rabbis in the world didn't know all the reasons of all the mitzvot. But we still follow the mitzvot. We, we understand all of them. Don't. We know Hashem said to do it. But the wisdom of King Solomon is different than the wisdom of all the rabbis that existed in the world. King Solomon became a king when he was 12 years old. Right the way he became the judge. Think about it. The head of the rabbinical Supreme Court, age 12, before his bar mitzvah. There are big giants, Chachamim, 80, 90 years old in his days. He's 12. Didn't put fill in yet. 12. And he has to be the king and the main judge. How he became a king in such a young age? His father David died at 70. He had a brother that wanted to fool the nation and claim the kingdom. But Nathan the prophet ran quickly with Bathsheba, the mother of Shlomo, ran quickly to David before he passed and make him swear to keep his previous promise that King Shlomo will be the king after him. And then when David Amelech said, he was only 12, what can you do? If he's not going to be the king, someone else will take it. When he went to sleep first night of his kingdom, Hashem came to him in a dream. What would you like to get from me, Shlomo? He could have, won he could have asked for wealth, winning the wars, living long life, all kinds of things that people request. Good children, you know. But the answer, nar katon lo edat vabo. I'm only a little child. I don't know where to go, what to do. Please give your servant a heart to hear and judge the nation fairly. To tell the difference between good and bad. Because otherwise, who would be able to judge this nation without those skills? Only give me something that I will be able to serve you in a proper way. Nothing personal for himself. Hashem liked very much his request. And he said to him, because you asked this and you didn't ask for long life and wealth and to win against your enemies, I'm going to give you everything. Because you wanted something for the sake of heaven, you're going to get also as a bonus wealth and power and victories in the wars and everything else that you, sh you could have asked for. So King Solomon is different. Why? Because he got his wisdom as a gift from Hashem in a later time in his life. Wisdom, you're born with that. Either you're a smart kid or a stupid kid. How do you know if your child is smart or stupid? There are two indications. Don't go home and now make experiments on your children. <laughs> I already know what you're thinking. You're anxiously waiting for me to tell you the two things. And right away tomorrow, 7 a.m. Moshe, come. I want to I wanna ask you, sir. Don't do it at home. There are two indications. One, fear, second, shame. If they have fear and shame, they are smart. If not, they are stupid. What does it mean, fear and shame? Fear, before they do something dangerous, jumping from cliffs, doing all kinds of crazy things, they think 10 times. Do it. No, no. That's okay, you do it. I'm afraid. No. Come on, be a man. Here, try. Try, try. No, no, it's okay. Come, be a man. What, are you afraid? Yes, I'm afraid. I don't want to become an addict and destroy my life. A fool? Give me, give more? Only this? That's a moron, a fool. Driving like crazy, has no vision, passing a car. Wow, a truck will come around the corner. You're going to die. He is willing to take a risk. It's a fool. 
He sees a dangerous animals. He comes near. Ah, what are you doing? There's a bear here. Monsi, bear, walking in the backyard. He wants to hug him. Smart kid, run, lock himself inside the house. Call 911. I'm sad, police, I'm dying. What? There's a black bear here. Smart kid. Someone offer him a candy on the street. L little boy, look what I got for you. Give it to your mother, you idiot. He begins to run. Oh, smart kid, he's afraid. <laughs> I remember, until today, my cousin make fun at me. 50 years later, they still make fun at me. When I went to my cousins in Afula, I was maybe five, six years old. Mike, actually no, actually this story has to be later because the pizza is about 40 something years old. So maybe I was 10. They opened the best pizza shop in the world. You go there, you never saw pizza like this in the whole world. They win all kinds of awards. They make articles about them. They checked all over, they always win. Unbelievable. So they are in Afula. Back then, 40 something years ago, Afula was like a village, it wasn't like a real city. You had uh, trees and, uh, and uh, vineyards and, and uh, orchards and you know, it was mamash like, a, like you go in nature. And there were a lot of Arabs walking in the street with the kafia on their head. So I'm a little child. They told me, you know the way from the pizza to the house is about 10 minutes walk. You make two turns, you go straight, make a, le make a left, go straight, make a right, and you go to the house. That's it, no big deal. You, you sure you know the way to the house? Yes. I started to walk, then I see an Arab man comes in front of me on the sidewalk with the kafia. I started to run like crazy, crying. Someone found me in the street, said, where are you going? I already forgot about the way. Thought this Arab was gonna kidnap me or something. So, oh, don't worry, they're not doing anything. Back then the Arabs were not 1% of what they are today. Barely ever they attacked back then. But when I got home, everybody saw I'm crying. Was it? What happened? <laughs> I saw an Arab on the street. Ah, my cousin were on the floor. Because like, they live there every day, they see them. For them it was nothing. It's better you can, people make fun at you, but it shows you smart. You don't take risk. You see something, maybe a danger, you run. You know all these Libras who say, why are you so judgmental? I say, let me ask you a question. You are not judgmental? How many times you walk to a place and you see a dangerous teenager? You know, he has the whole nine yards. You know right away what's in his pockets. And right the way you cross the street. Why are you so judgmental? Why? Why when you go to certain neighborhoods in New York, you close the windows and lock the car? Why are you so judgmental and racist? All these liberals are such hypocrites. It's unbelievable. They preach to you and they are the biggest judgmental people. Let's see a right he can open his mouth next to them and they let him speak. If you want to speak, they call the police. There is a bomb in a, in a, in a hall. Why? Because they didn't get to cancel your event, so they're going to call the police and say someone put a bomb. Did you ever see a righty try to cancel a lefty event? Never. All righty events, they try to cancel. They call, they threaten the owner of the place. How do you let him speak? We're going to demonstrate, we will wait by the door, we will put your business in a band. They speak anywhere, everywhere, free. Nobody demonstrate next to them. Nobody threat anyone, nobody say don't let them speak. They don't let anyone speak. And then they say in the name of democracy, oh, democracy for lefties, yeah. Righties don't exist. So... <laughs> One example is shame, is fear. Second, shame. How do you know someone that is embarrassed to do things in public, in front of people, is smart? Adam and Eve, they were born without wisdom yet, before they ate from the tree. 
They walk like animals, like monkeys. Monkeys walk naked. Monkeys are embarrassed to be naked. No. Monkey, monkeys have intimacy. They embarrass if someone will see them in a safari. People take pictures. They are not embarrassed. Other animals are embarrassed to walk naked. No. Adam and Eve walk naked. They were not embarrassed. As soon as they ate from the tree of knowledge, tree of wisdom, what happened to them? Right away they felt horrible shame that they're naked. What's the first, first reaction of receiving wisdom? Shame. Modesty. When you see all the women walk naked in the street, you know their head is empty. Smart woman, intelligent woman, will never agree to walk half naked like an animal. The fact that she's willing to walk like this in the street shows that her brain is empty. Because it cannot be that you go to a level of animal, walk naked in the street with your children, not to talk about being an actress in a movie and doing horrible things that the whole world would see you. Someone like that obviously has zero, zero wisdom. Remember, wisdom is not that you know math, or you know how to invest, or you know uh, history, or whatever you learn in college. That's gaining knowledge, that's nothing. We're talking wisdom. Wisdom means to tell the difference between right and wrong, good and bad. If you don't have shame, it's a, it's a sign that you're stupid. Spiritually stupid. You can be a, prof a, a math professor. You can be an astronaut. You can be a, a, a scientist. Obviously, and you, you have some education. We don't care about that. We care about wisdom, meaning you're smart or you're stupid. You're clever, you understand things, you predict things, you understand one thing from another. That's wisdom. Shame and fear. Smart person, King Solomon writes, the smartest person ever live. What does he write? Ashrei Adam mefachet tamid. Person that always live in fear is the greatest one. Not like today, oh, religion is intimidating, Rabbi, I don't like the pressure. My God, I don't like to think about my God as someone who's looking for me to catch me doing something wrong, that he can hunt me. You know these liberals, how they talk? I'm talking religious liberals. That's not my God. Who cares about what you think, what you don't like? You don't. We care what the books are saying. The Torah is full of examples. You're with me, you listen to me, I will benefit you and reward you. You don't, you're gonna deal with the consequences. One punishment after the other, until you scream and beg for your life, not to talk about what's happening in hell. That's the real reality. Everything else is lies and nonsense. That's why I tell you, stay away from these kind of speakers and rabbis. They will bring you expressed well with them. Hand by hand. My, my God, I, there is a misconception. I heard one, he's not even a rabbi, he's just a host. Somebody here in Brooklyn. There is a misconception like God is somebody cruel who is looking for people to do something wrong that he can punish them. Meaning, don't be afraid of God. Be free. Back to the 70s. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Be a happy Jew. Have fun. Do whatever you like. Don't worry, God is with you. He's sachbak, he's in your pocket. What can I do that it's written that David Amelech writes in Tehillim? Not me, don't say I can predict these liberals. David Amelech in Tehillim. Samar mi pachdecha besari. My skin is goosebumps from fear from you, God. I'm shaking from fear for what I've done or I may have done. I'll give you thousands of examples. We'll finish with one final example. I tell you a story from the Gemara and you decide who is right. What I say or these liberals, some of those clowns. 
רבי יוחנן lived a full life of 120 years, ביג צדיק. Before he passed, he was in bed, a student came to pay him a final visit. Rabbi, why are you so nervous? Why are you so worried? He was shaking. He said, if I would go to a trial in front of a human being that is a judge, I will be shaken. Who knows what can the judge can rule. Now when I go in, and this is a human being that you can bribe him, you can do things, maybe you can get out of it, I will still be full of fear. Now when I go in front of a judge that you cannot bribe and you cannot hide anything from him, and I'm, a, I'm about to face my trial with him, I won't be shaking. So a student told him, but all your life you learned Torah and you did only good things. He's the biggest tzaddik. Not to talk about the suffering that he had in his life and all kinds of tragedies. What are you afraid of? If you are worried, that means we are finished. <laughs> no one is perfect like you. So, Rabbi, before you leave us, please give us a blessing. You know what the blessing he gave them? I give you a blessing that you would fear God just like you fear people, like you fear the policemen on the road, you fear the FBI, you fear uh, some dictators. You fear people, everyone fear people. Fear the gangster, the mafia, people that you owe money, they'll come to kill you. Shaking. I give you a blessing that your level of fear will reach the level of fear that you have from human being. When I learned this Gemara, I say to myself, from all the blessing in the world, that's the blessing he chose to give them. He could have given them another blessing. You should be great tzaddikim. I bless you that you be attached to Hashem, that you be real lovers of Hashem. That you all your life do Kiddush Hashem, something. What is this negative? I'm giving you a blessing that you're gonna fear God like you fear people. Fear, we fear people all the time. You fear this, you fear the highway, you fear that, you fear that. We live, we're full of fears. Fear God like you fear the policeman on the road when he pull you over. One night, 2 a.m., I was on my way to Monsey Palisades Parkway after a long night in Brooklyn, tired, dying to get home already. Back then, the speed limit on the Palisades was 50. Why they make it so slow? They want to they wanna rob you. They're going to drive 70. They're going to give you a big ticket. So I drove in the Palisades a little bit or a lot above the speed limit. And it's all trees on the side. No, no lights. Dark, complete darkness. No cars on the road, 2 a.m. All of a sudden, lights. It's so scary. Wee, wee. Two guys with the hand on the gun. Wow, they just caught El Capone. <laughs> it's so sad. That's one of the only countries that a policeman pull you over and there's a 50% chance to get a bullet to his head. It never happened in Israel. I mean, there's a lot of criminals in Israel as well, but you never heard that someone was pulled over and he shot the cop. Only here people like to shoot cops. And get away with that. Now they have cameras. You can't get away with that anymore. But anyway, I opened the window, driver license, registration, the whole nine yards. And my hand was shaking like this. I felt my hands is shaking. I'm opening the glove compartment. The registration is in front of my eyes, the insurance. Back then, they didn't have computer in the car. They, uh, today, they don't need anything. They really have everything in the car. And I can't find it. It's in front of my eyes, but I'm so stressed. Finally, I found it. And he went back to his car, and I was, my, my heart was on 200. And that, this Gemara came back to me. I say, wow, imagine if I would fear God like I fear this loser. 
Imagine this. If one time you spoke Lashon Hara and right away, whoa, whatever I've done, and your heart would go to 200 and you begin to sweat and your hands is shaking. Did it ever happen to you? When you by mistake broke Shabbat, did it happen to you? When you spoke Lashon Hara about an important person, did it happen to you? When you just ate something and someone just told you, what did you, what did you do? It's not kosher. Did it happen to you? Usually it doesn't happen. No matter what sin a person commits, it doesn't happen. So that's the blessing he gave them. Fear God like you fear people. If you get to that level, you'll be all righteous. Because you live with fear, constant fear. Fear saved from sins. If you live with fear, you worry how to talk to your wife. Because you know Hashem gets very angry when you put her down. When you disrespect when you don't fulfill what you sign in a ktuba. If the wife would have fear from God, she would think a million times before she make a comment to her husband. After all, it's written that she has to treat him like a king. So if she would treat him like a king because she's afraid of Hashem, because Hashem said so, and he will treat her like a queen because Hashem said so, they will not have one argument in 20 years. That's it. Once you don't have God in your life and you don't have fear from Him, then you begin to put them down and ungrateful and curse and the rest of the, the things that happens to them. It all comes down to you have fear or you don't have fear. And people look at fear as something negative. That's the biggest mistake of this generation. It's the greatest gift. So what if you live in fear? No one died from fear. Fear saves. Fear saves children from drugs, from being kidnapped from getting hit by a car. Fear saves from a lot of tragedies. Fear to cheat saves you from destroying your life. Fear from stealing and doing all kinds of uh, fraudulent activity. F afraid of a federal jail and what's gonna happen to you over there saves you from destroying your life. Fear from what's gonna come out of your children if you send them to public school. Not that you're such a tzaddik. But you saw so many kids that went to public school and what came out of them and you're so afraid, you, your stinginess was cancelled. You write a check and you send them to a good yeshiva, even though you're very stingy. But why you did it? Because you're so afraid that the children will be like the f children of your friend that went to public school and look what happened to that family. So fear is actually the best thing. So why are you so afraid of it? From now on, when someone tells you fear it's not the way, only love, 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 you know he's the hippie from Woodstock. Love, love, love. One big rebbe said something smart. He said fear only with no love of God, it's not perfect. I mean, yes, you're afraid to commit sins, but you don't really have relationship with Hashem. You don't have the love. What about the love? It says, Ve'avta et Hashem lokecha. Fear and love. It should say, Le'ava u'le'ira et Hashem. Love without fear, it's nothing. It's illusion. Fear without love, it's not perfect. But it's something. Love without fear, it's nothing. It's all an illusion. It's not such thing, only love. Because if you love with your boss, you have no fear for him. <laughs> what, what, what is he going to do to you? It's not, he tells you to do something you don't do. We're buddies, we're friend, best friends. Once your boss, you have no fear from him, it's affecting the way you perform. Everything he tells you, half of it you don't do. Or you do it chick chuck shortcut. Because you don't have a fear to be, get fired. You don't have a fear to get penalized. You don't have the fear. If you have the fear, you become a great worker or a great soldier. If you have no fear, drive, people that drive on the highway, they are very calm. Why? Not because they're good drivers. They want to drive 100 miles an hour with the BMW Sport that they just got. But why they drive so slow on the highway? Because every five minutes there's a camera. Go in Ocean Parkway, do you see anyone speed? Every block you have a camera. Every block. You have to, it's like jogging. You run, you run faster than the cars, 25. Some people run faster. 
they made it so slow and you can drive one minute in Ocean Parkway and get 10 tickets by mail for one minute. 10 tickets. If you don't know this camera, you don't have ways. Somebody drove 35 miles an hour on Ocean Parkway, which is still very slow. 35. He's gonna get one ticket. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Each ticket, $500 in a minute. If he's aware of the cameras, he's afraid. Checks everywhere. Checking the phone. Why? He just got saved from $500 damage. So fear helps? Of course it helps. It's the best help in life. Everyone who ever tell you otherwise, stay away from them. They modify the Torah and they are reform. I don't care who they are and what title they have. Don't be impressed by titles and images. We have what's written in the Torah and in the holy books. All these karaoke speakers that all of a sudden they decided to make the man the Amar. People have, it's a misconception that God is after me to hunt me. All this nonsense. Stay away from this kind of people. Trust me when I tell you. They won't get you anywhere. When you hear strong Musar, you feel like your stomach is flipping over, your tem body temperature is rising, you think a million times about what you're doing or not doing. Hashem decided to wake you up. See how much Hashem loves you? But that's a sign for me that time came to an end. The lecture, that's the time I said I should not go past 11. So Bezrat Hashem, I think we made the point clear. We will see you Bezrat Hashem next Tuesday, 8.15. Baruch Adonai Leolam. אמן ואמן, רבי חנניה בן הקשיא אומר, רצה הקדוש ברוך הוא לזכות את ישראל